Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Florida Sound Archive podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Kaiser, and for today's episode, I have on with me a very special guest. Let's welcome in Laura Simpson Lindauer. She is a drummer and has done a lot in the music scene in South Florida, especially in the 90s and early 2000s. Laura, hello, welcome in. Hi, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I'm so glad to have you on the podcast to tell your story. Uh, we were just chatting a little bit before we started recording about the work that you do at the Broward Center of the Performing Arts, and you've been doing that for a long time. Yeah, on and off for many years you know, since the 90s. So I come and go, come and go, but I always kind of land there. I feel like I kind of grew up in the Broward Center, <laughs> really. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure there's worse places you could spend your time. So absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it's great to have you. And I know you're going to have a lot of really amazing things to share because you've been in the scene for a long time. And I want to go back to your early beginnings, where it all started for you. So tell listeners, tell viewers, uh, where'd you grow up? Um, I grew up as a child. We were in New Jersey, my family, um, I was always kind of that little kid into music, you know, buying like seven inches and, you know, the Star Wars double album, the Grease double album, dancing around my grandma's house, like listening to music, uh, Andy Gibb, Sean Cassidy. I was very, a, a child of the seventies, um, you know, backseat in my mom's car, listening to Fleetwood Mac and the Eagles. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I always, cause, you know, was a big sort of music kid. Um, we moved to Miami in 1980, which was a really weird year to move to Miami. It was like Mario Boatlift. It was like Cocaine Cowboys. It was very different from my little white bread New Jersey town. You know, we, there was like where I grew up, there was no diversity. So moving down here was like, wow, you know, it was it was, it was a change. Right. But um, so we moved to Miami Um Actually, we moved super south, Cutler Ridge, which is now Cutler Bay, but so very south. Um, I ended up with a group of friends, these girls, and we all would go to concerts at the Hollywood Sportatorium. This is like high school era, right? So we were into like metal, like Motley Crue, Van Halen, you know, the Scorpions, Judas Priest. We would go to Iron Maiden, you know, ACDC, like all of those shows. We, we, were, <laughs> we were these group of girls who would like, throw all our money together, rent a limo and, and go to the Sporto with no ride home because we couldn't afford the limo for that long. And we would just kind of like get a ride home from whatever random guy we could sort of, you know, trick into driving us back to Cutler Bay. Um, but we decided we were going to start a band. We didn't need to just see these boys play. We're going to start a band of our own. So we did. <laughs> we didn't know how to play or anything. We didn't have any instruments, but we had boys who had instruments or as our friends. So we started sort of playing on their stuff. And uh, we called ourselves Leather Tees uh, out of a Motley Crue song of the time. Very and nice. um, yeah, so, you know, we actually did play some shows. The first show we ever played was like three months after we started our, playing our instruments, period. Like we didn't know how to play shit, but we were like, we're gonna play this Battle of the Bands <laughs> in Hialeah. I don't remember the name of the place, but it was a disaster. But after the show, people came up to me and said, oh, you're kind of a good drummer. And I was like, oh, OK, all right, I'm going to keep doing this. <laughs> Where did you learn how to play? Self-taught, just self-taught. I had um, my parents had a garage and I had a friend, this dude who gave me like his throwaway drum kit. I had no cymbals. So I would just put things where symbols should go and just smash them when, you know, I thought like a symbol would be appropriate. <laughs> and um, I finally, I didn't even get like a real kit, like a real, I got my first real kit was um, a Tamba Grand Star. It was a pink sparkle with a 24 inch bass drum, right? So it was like, a tw -tw. and um, I didn't get that till I was like 18. So I was always just borrowing other people's kits. Like we, you know, the Leather Tees girls, we played like, um, we played the Battle of the Bands. We played some warehouse in Miami called the Harry Eyeball, which I don't even think was, you know, had a permit to be a place because it got broke, you know, the police broke it up. We played a biker party where we had to like 
flee because things were getting very shady. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that was kind of the beginning. Did any other members of Leather Tees do anything else in the scene? Um, you know, no, they really didn't. They sort of just branched off and did other things. We remained friends, even, you know, on social media still to this day. Um, but, you know, they off, they went off and sort of did their own thing. A couple of them moved to L.A. Um, and dated rock stars, <laughs> but didn't become any. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I, I was the sole survivor of that. <laughs> it sounds like it. And yeah. when you were in this phase, right, listening to metal, going to the Sporto in this all girl band leather tees, what did your family think about what you were doing? Oh, <sighs> Well, <laughs> oh God, um, I wouldn't say they were supportive uh, because I was just a hellion, you know what I mean? Like I was just like, they didn't know where I was half the time because remember it was the eighties, you know, they had that like thing where like it's 10 PM, do you know where your kids are? And they were always like, nope, <laughs> I was yeah, not around. <laughs> they had to have the police pick me up more than several occasions. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What are I was those situations? Bad. Yeah, <laughs> it's not good. Um, just, you know, just we we were the girls who were like um, hanging out backstage and like going back to the hotel, not not groupies because we were really young and we were just kind of very innocent. But it was Miami. It was the 80s. There was a lot of drugs. There was a lot of cocaine. There was, a lot, you know, and we were we were just in it. You know what I mean? So we would show up with this group of like seven underage girls who were kind of cute we all had drugs we always got backstage and we'd be out you know partying with like tommy lee or you know what i mean like just literally that kind of thing you know and then we'd go back to high school you know on monday with all these stories and people were like yeah, really <laughs> and i was like yeah it's true <laughs> what other venues locally were you stumbling upon at that time as well where were you going um you know we were like even as an underage kid, we were, we were going to like the tree house. Um, I think which was, was in Hallandale, right? I don't, yeah. Right. The tree house, the button South. Um, really that's it. I mean, those were kind of the main places because the, at that time, like the bands that were big were like kind of hair metal. Like it was like crier, right? Like triple X who are our friends who are from Hialeah they had a really nice um, practice space with like a soundboard and a drum riser. And so they would let us come and hang out and, you know, use their gear. So we were kind of getting a little better <laughs> through them. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think like, yeah, there were a lot of bands like that who were kind of supportive of us because we were friends, you know, and they just wanted to see us succeed, you know, but we were kind of like, eh, we weren't that serious. You know what I mean? We just wanted to be around the rock and roll boys kind of at that time. But I was, you know, I was kind of serious about the drums, but the band itself wasn't a serious band. <laughs> right. Yeah. And also, I imagine you were really young. How old were you at that time? Oh, God, we were like 15, 16 years old, 17, you know, like we were certainly not supposed to be in any clubs. <laughs> but yeah, we got in. <laughs> I've heard a lot of stories like that where. Yeah. It was a bit of a free for all in that period. Yeah, it right? was. <laughs> Especially if you were a young girl or just a woman in general, you can get into places like that. No Absolutely. Questions, no questions yeah. asked. <laughs> nope, not at all. <laughs> so after Leather Tees, what did you wind up getting into after that? Um, so I my family actually moved from way down south, Cutler Ridge, um, to Hollywood. So that kind of, I didn't have a car. I was, I think, 18 at the time, you know, and we sort of drifted apart and that was fine. I, I still had my killer, you know, pink sparkle drum set. <laughs> it was like, you know, so I was just kind of playing to myself and practicing and whatnot. And um, about night, I want to say 92, I ended up um, playing with these girls in a band called Wig Party, um, W-H-I-G, Wig Party. Um, girl named Jody. Honestly, I can't remember the other girls. I found a picture though. <laughs> we I played uh, Washington Square. I used to have Thon. You know, it was like a marathon where just like all the bands would play. 
And so I found this picture. It's me uh, playing at Thon. Oh, I can't get it right in there. But it's 1992. And I was like, Danny Shaman sent us this pic picture of new Whig Party drummer, Laura Simpson, seen here at Thon, 92. And I was like, wow, cool. I think it was in like Jam Magazine. So I was like super psyched. Like, oh, yeah. look at me. <laughs> oh, that is pretty amazing. How did, you was, get, how did you get involved with Whig Party? Honestly, I thought I, oh, you know what? I do know how. So in about 92, I started sort of getting more, you know, I got back into the scene where I live. So it was more Hollywood, Fort Lauderdale now instead of Miami. And I, I met this band Love Canal. Um, and so I became friends with them, started hanging. And I think just being, you know, back into the scene again, maybe sort of, I don't know. I, I really can't remember how or who or why, but I ended up with wig party and that didn't last very long, but it was, it was kind of like getting back into it. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Besides playing Washington square with them, do you remember any other places you may have played? Um, we played Cactus Cantina down in Miami. It was mainly a lot of Miami shows. And I don't know why that is. I, I don't know if they were Miami based or not. Um, but yeah, I don't really remember a lot. I know that we did the Thon thing. We did uh, Cactus Cantina. We had a falling out because <laughs> um, they wanted me to contribute to warehouse rent. And I didn't have any money, so they locked my drums up. <laughs> and I was like dude, give me my drums back. Like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> we got in the whole thing. I got my shit. And I was like, fuck you guys. I'm out. Which was, you know, that's how shit goes sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's one of those situations where, you know, hey. you, need, you need your drums. You know, I totally get it. And uh, so did you ever have any opportunities to bury the hatchet with them after all that time or? You know, yeah, I actually did. And it was fine. It, you know, it was kind of funny because I ran into them not even a few years back. And it was, I think it was like downtown Fort Lauderdale. And I was just like, we were talking. Um, <laughs> it was with a mutual friend. And I didn't realize like some of the wig party girls were there. And I was kind of shit talking them in front of their face. <laughs> Until I realized, oh, that was you oh no oh no we're good we're good so it, it was all it, it worked out <laughs> it was fine glad it worked out and and uh yeah and <laughs> no hard feelings no hard feelings yeah they needed their warehouse friend i get it <laughs> water under the bridge at this point i imagine totally. so uh so after wig party this was now your second band that you right played with so we're talking early 90s. You mentioned this was around 92. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a pretty solid year, I feel like, for music in South Florida. So you mentioned Love Canal was one of those bands, and I remember them. I would hear them on Zeta all the time. And they, well, were, yeah. lo and, and they were a local band. So I was like, wait a minute. That's interesting because I knew Zeta played a lot of bands. Well, who they, had, they had a lot of interest from, I think it was like they, Sony or somebody because came down and wanted to give them a development deal. I remember at that time, which was kind of like what was going on with a lot of local bands at the time, you know, because of the Manson thing. And, you know, like we were starting to get attention. I think, you know, I remember going to see them, going to see Manson and like, I want to say it was like 89, 90, like really early, you know, the spooky kids when, you know, Brad was still alive. Right. So Gidget Gain writes, and uh, going to see them at like a uh, reunion room. And, you know, they were just like a local band coming up at that point, but they were getting more attention. So South Florida in general, like the Mavericks, right? You know, like people who were big, who were coming up, sort of were getting that attention at that time. Um, so, yeah. I mean, quite the contrast, I feel like, between those two bands in particular, the yeah. Man Manson <laughs> and the Spooky Kids and the Mavericks. So, right. Who did you gravitate more to at that time? Well, obviously it was Manson. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I remember seeing them. Um, I worked with a girl. I worked at um, Specs Music. I was a manager there when I was like 21 or something, like super young. And um, I worked with a girl, Jill, who's an amazing artist who's still around. But um, 
she introduced me. Like she had like a cassette, like Marilyn Manson, the spooky kids. She's like, you got to come see them. You got to see them. So I was like, okay, went to see them. I was like, oh yeah, this is really cool. Like this, I like this, you know, this is the next thing I think. Um, you know, so it was kind of like, um, it was inspiring, I think almost because it was this new energy sort of coming out of our little scene, <laughs> which, you know, South Florida, like what? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And to your point, they were one of the larger bands. I guess they had a pretty good following at that time. Oh, yeah. Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and... Yeah. They had a big draw. They always had like, you know, big crowds, that kind of thing. Um, I'm trying to think. Did you remember any other bands who were playing with them at that time too? Any other local bands who were playing some of those shows back then with Marilyn Manson? Um, with Manson, not so much, but I just was thinking like, cause I was like kind of going down that, you know, <laughs> rabbit hole of like bands from back in the day. And I just remember like, there were so many bands that were so good. Right. There was like, there was like, uh, I don't know right? Based out of Miami. There was the Holy Terrors, obviously, right? Dory Soul was an amazing band that I loved. There was um, in Bougalard, Creamy Electric Santa, you know, there were all of these bands, Chicken Head, All's Not Well, uh, Ed Matusa's Struggle, you know, all of these kind of bands that were, there was so, so much talent happening at that time. You know, it was such a great time down here for music. It really was. And it really does cross the spectrum and, you know, regarding the different sounds, because all those bands you mentioned, they're all different in their own way. And right. So yeah. And the thing is, like, nobody was sort of competitive. Everybody was very supportive. And you know what I mean? Like, everybody was cool. There was no sort of, you know, bullshit between bands. Everybody was very, you know, like yeah, let's, I'll hook you up and we'll be good. You know what I mean? It was all good. <laughs> Did you have a favorite that you would go out and see more often than some of the others? Oh God. I mean, I was out all the time. I saw, <laughs> I saw them all. My, I mean, honestly, of all those bands, huh? I can't even think, I don't know. who was my favorite at that time in the, you know, those early 90s years. It was probably Marilyn Manson, honestly. It probably was. The Spooky Kids, when it was still like Brad and, and Scott, right. you know, and Brian, yeah. And because you were going to see them so often, did you wind up becoming friends with any of the members of the Spooky Kids at that time too? I was friends with Brad, um, Gidget Gain. Um, you know, we played together sort of at his house a few times, you know, where he just wanted to do other things. So he'd, you know, invite me over and, and, uh, we would just jam. <laughs> um, but the thing with that was like, I always had a crush on Brad. <laughs> so I was there for like multiple purposes. <laughs> I was trying so hard, not his type, but right. yeah, he, yeah, <laughs> he was not going for it, but yeah, like, um, yeah, so, you know, yeah. And for those that may not have known Brad, because he was with the band early on mm -hmm. and unfortunately, you know, passed away quite young too. So very early. For those that didn't know him, you know, how would you describe him to people who may never, maybe never had a chance to, to know Brad or perhaps see him play before? He was, he was an amazing, very like a, he was a sweet soul, really. You know what I mean? He wasn't, he was kind of quiet. He was, he was just a really, he was just a really nice guy. You know what I mean? He was, you know, it, it was, a, it sucked, you know, when he died, it was really, it was, it wasn't a shock, but it was shocking nonetheless. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I think I may have met him briefly. It was a, a, a horror convention. Mm -hmm. I think he had his band, the Dolly Gaggers. If I'm I yes, that, yeah. Am I getting that right? So yeah, the Dolly Gaggers. Yeah, it was around that. D A L I time. like Dolly. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It was it was yeah. around that time, and I'm pretty sure he was. I, I only chatted with him for a couple minutes. Uh, he was set up at a table. It was a very, his area was kind of quiet, and uh, 
and I don't, I don't remember how long after that he passed away, but I feel like it wasn't that long. Well, he actually ended up with, um, um, being with a, a, a girlfriend of mine as his girlfriend, um, a girl named Linda. And, um, I remember one time it was Linda and him and me and my ex-husband went to go see Johnny Cash and June Carter Cash at the Broward Center. Um, so this must have been back when I worked there because I never would have paid for tickets. <laughs> But yeah, the four of us went out and we saw Johnny Cash <laughs> and that was cool. That's a good memory. Yeah. So we're now, this, we're talking again, early nineties when this was all going on. So what was your next band? What did you wind up getting into? Uh, um, right after that was Jack off Jill. Um, it, you know, it was, let me make sure that is correct. But yeah, Jack off Jill. I literally had to mine my own like memories to go like, oh, what happened then? Yeah, the 90s were a wild blur. But yeah, so after that was Jack off Jill. So how that happened was my sister was dating Jeff Tucci from Lode. And Lode and Jack off Jill had warehouses in the same warehouse, you know, kind of area. It was like off Cypress Creek and like Dixie and Fort Lauderdale somewhere. And they had like warehouses. So my sister had heard from Jeff that Jack off Jill needed a new drummer and guitar player. Basically, I guess Tenny and Michelle from early Jack off Jill decided they were out. So they were out. So my sister was like, Hey, my sister's a drummer. She should, you should let her come and audition. So they give me a call. I showed up. We all hit it off. Everything was cool. And they're like, you're in the band. There was um, a guitar player whose name was Kid. Well, his name was Steve, but we call, we all called him the Kid, right? He was just Kid. And so he was in on guitar at that time. And, um, you know, we played a bunch of shows like that. And um, <laughs> at the time, Jack Off Jill was courting like labels, right? So they were already, you know, at kind of that next, ready to jump to the next level. You know, they had a following, they had all these fans, but now they had a brand new drummer and they, you know, had a guitarist that was like, okay, but not, you know, like top tier. So we ended up getting signed by Risk Records, which was like this indie label out of LA. Hold on, sorry. And, um, the label didn't like the guitarist. They were like, you guys need a, a, a different guitarist, somebody maybe to take it to the next level. So we ended up asking Jeff Tucci from Load if he would fill in just as a guitarist, like not to be part of the band, but just as a fill in, you know, to record and tour or whatever. And he agreed, you know, so um, that's how that particular lineup happened. <laughs> Did you have any shows under your belt before that happened? If so, where were you playing with Jack Off Jill from what you can remember? I found a bunch of flyers here from Jack Off Jill. This one, <laughs> this one is like Jack Off Jill in the underbellies. This one still has kid because I can see the little guy and he's got a K on his shirt. <laughs> so that was before Jeff. <laughs> Um, that was at Squeeze, because a lot of it was at Squeeze, always. Um, I think this one was also at Squeeze. It was the first all-ages show at Squeeze. Interestingly, this is Jordy White's, um, like, kindergarten picture or something that Jessica just happened to have and used it as a flyer. <laughs> He's in there somewhere as a child. Wow. <laughs> I don't know which one he is. But, yeah, so... We did play a bunch of shows with Kid before, you know, switching him out for Jeff, um, which was awkward because we love Kid and, you know, nobody likes to do that sure. <laughs> to somebody. Why do you but, think uh, there were so many shows at Squeeze? What was it about Squeeze that brought Jack Up Jill to that stage? So m perhaps more often than some of the other places that were around. Well, Squeeze was like home. Honestly, it was it was like. It really was home. Jack Kearney, who owned Squeeze, was so supportive of local music. You know, he was he was like the godfather of local music at that time. And he really sort of gave everybody the stage, you know, like there were so many bands that he 
kind of, you know, Livid Kittens and like, you know, all of these other bands. He would, he, and he was so supportive. And plus all of our favorite bartenders were there. <laughs> so we always drank for free. I probably owe them about $20,000. <laughs> and, you know, the, the ladies room at Squeeze was like, you know, bathroom stalls at Squeeze. <laughs> So that was kind of like our home base and it was, you know, Fort Lauderdale, which is where we all live. So it was, it was always a fun party there. Right. What were the crowds like back then for some of those Jack Off Jill shows? Packed. Like you couldn't move. It was the all ages show. Holy shit. Like that was really crazy. And Jack off Jill used to have some really good merch. I wish I hold, held on to any of it. Like we would have really good t-shirts that would get kids suspended from school when they wore them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It would be like lovely devil cunt. You know, and they'd be like, yeah, I got suspended. And you're like, cool. <laughs> good. I guess. Yeah. But you know, so it was, we always like the, the crowds were huge. Like we really always did really well in squeeze, but, um, yeah, that's where we did our record release party, and it was insane. Yeah. What record was that for? That was for Sexless Demons and Scars, which was Jessica's idea for a name. We were all like, nah, okay, but um, yeah, <laughs> we um, the first time I went to the studio with them, we did a seven inch, which I also found digging through my little archives, and this was it, and it was two songs, American Made and Girl Scouts, um, recorded at Digital Beach with Mike Strick, who I love, he's the best. I've recorded there so many times. <laughs> um, but so that was basically the first time I recorded with them. And during that session, Brian, Marilyn Manson Warner shows up and he's, I'm the new drummer, remember, I, he doesn't know me from anybody. He knew me from trying to hit on me, but he didn't know me as a drummer. <laughs> and uh, he shows up and he's like, well, if she sucks, you can always just use a drum machine to my face. <laughs> I was just like, fuck you, are you serious? Yeah, needless to say, they did not get a drum machine. Right. Yeah. So was that the first time you and him interacted in that way before? Um, in a studio type of way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, like I said, he had tried to talk to me a bunch of couple other times and I was just like, oh. yeah. And plus he was with Missy at the time, his, his girl from a long time that he wrote about in his book and everything else. I didn't know her yet. Then I had not met her yet. I met her for the first time. Um, Jack off Jill just with no guitarists at this time, it was just me, Robin and Jessica decided we were going to go to New Orleans and stay with Missy and Brian. Um, he was recording Antichrist Superstar at the time with Trent Reznor. And he lived in this beautiful home, both of them in the Garden District in New Orleans. So we went to stay there, um, met Missy and her and I just fucking bam, hit it off. Like, you know, totally like, oh, OK, this me and her are right here. <laughs> Brian, in the meantime, you know, he's busy, they're recording, they're doing all these things. Um, we're there, it's Southern Decadence that weekend in New Orleans, which is like the gay pride, you know, like New Orleans crazy. So we all decided we were going to do acid. <laughs> so we come back to the house, we're all sitting on the floor, me, Missy and Jessica staring at a shower curtain, just tripping. And Brian comes home and he's mad. What are you guys doing? What's going on here? And we're just like, nothing, nothing. We're not doing anything. Meanwhile, I had to go sleep in a bedroom in their house. Well, actually it was a living room, but it had this painting from John Wayne Gacy, the serial killer of clowns dancing around the pits of hell. And that's what I had to look at laying in the couch like, oh my God, I can't sleep here. Like, I don't think I slept the whole time. <laughs> I was just like, this is terrible. But we had the best time and me and Missy ended up, you know, being really like best, best, best friends after that kind of trip. But um, I just remember from that trip, Brian and the rest of the band having a problem with Scott Pateski. Like they were trying to get him out of the band at that time. They, they were putting his shit in the microwave and like blowing it up just to be dicks. Like it was, it was kind of crazy. <laughs> Did you at all get to know Scott as well? 
Yeah, I knew Scott for a long time from here. Like me and Scott were friends. Um, my sister and Scott were friends. Yeah, Scott Scott was cool. That was another sad one when he went. Like that was very sad. Right. Yeah. I remember Scott and I went a um, bunch of years later. Some down at Churchill's. Some somebody put together a Jack off Jill tribute show, which I thought was hilarious. And so me and Scott decided to go because, you know, he played in that band after, you know, like as a favor as well, like later down the road. So me and him were like, let's, let's go to this Jack off Jill tribute show. I'm like, Hey, we'll just show up. And the, the people they were so happy we were there. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> One of my favorite Scott projects was Retung Gate. Mm -hmm. did, did you ever get a chance to see that band play out? Mm hmm. Yeah, I don't remember, t uh, you know, the details are in the mists of time. But yeah, I did see Three Ton Gate. Um, I remember after Scott passed, um, downtown Fort Lauderdale, Jeffrey Holmes um, put together a sort of a New Orleans funeral for him, where everybody sort of marched down the street, you know, and it was just kind of like a tribute. And we, and it was so, you know, that was really nice. There's video of that somewhere, I'm sure. It's, I don't have it, but somebody does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That does sound, uh, sound like a very nice tribute. I don't know if I've ever very seen nice. that before. Yeah, yeah, it's out there. So uh, you mentioned Missy, and I remember the first time I ever saw both you and her was in that Squeeze documentary that came out. <laughs> which, Chris um, Nicholas. <laughs> really yeah. glad that, that that was put together because it's one of the very few – visuals that you can really see of the story or some of the and everybody's in it everybody's in right. it right. yeah how did you get I'd involved with that it. just was there <laughs> just was there sweet like i said squeeze was kind of our second home you know it really was so you know just being able to see like bobby load you know still sort of out there and jeff and you know, everybody. It was really good. Were you going to a lot of shows at Squeeze outside of playing there? If so, who were some of the other local bands you would go see there? I mean, honestly, I was at Squeeze probably five nights a week. So whoever was playing, I, I would have seen them. You know, I was I was going through stuff, you know, so I was just out. I was always there. You know, I was that was literally I I would go. I, I would just show up by myself and I knew that I had my favorite bartenders, Kevin and uh, Douglas and Carrie and, you know, all of the, you had Willie at the door and there was like Jack and Michael and, you know, so it was, it was just like, it was sort of just, you know, a comfortable space. So anybody who was there, I saw them. <laughs> Name a show, I was probably there. Right, sure. <laughs> Even for the weird fetish nights. <laughs> I was just was like, oh, why am I here now? Like, I don't want to be here for this one, but I'm here. <laughs> right. If you're showing up yeah. as a regular, I guess it didn't matter. Yeah, what it that was it. You know, that was and probably it. I know in the in the documentary, a uh, very short little little bit, for, you know, with, with you and Missy, you know, just thinking back on that moment, though, what was that like for you, though, when you knew that? this place that not only did you play, but you were going to five nights a week was closing. <laughs> what was that feeling like for you? I mean, it did kind of feel like an end of an era. You know, we were sort of just like, okay, what do we do now? Which I think me and Missy say, and I was like, are we just go to rehab now? Like, is that what happens? <laughs> kind of, that is what happened <laughs> right. you did say for that. a bunch of people. <laughs> yeah. I think that probably was a good thing for a bunch of people that squeeze close. <laughs> It was a little too easy. <laughs> Everything right. was very, yeah. But um, yeah, so I'm trying to think like after that, um, hmm, with Jack off Jill, I mean, that was sort of though going back sort of before the squeeze closure, you know, doing our record release party there. That was amazing, right? So that was fantastic. And then after that, um, they put us, you know, they started sending us out places to play, right? So 
New York for College Music Journal Fest, which I don't even think is a thing anymore. But so it was CMJ Fest, we played with uh, Seven Dust, <laughs> you know, it's just a random assortment of people. They sent us out to LA to play a bunch of shows. We played the Whiskey, we played the Troubadour, we played all these places on the Sunset Strip, which was awesome. You know, that was for me, that was such a dream because I was an 80s, you know, being an 80s kid who used to go to LA because I had family in California every year. So I, you know, I was too young to get into those places, but I really wanted to be there. <laughs> right. So, to, you know, a bunch of years later to be able to be on those stages, knowing how the iconic people had played there before us, that was, that was a real treat. You know what I mean? What was the reaction um, like from crowds out, whether it was in New York or out in LA compared to the crowds in South Florida? You know what? We always had a really great crowd. I mean, we, Jessica, I have to say, was a very good front person. You know, she was very intense. She would cut herself with razors and bleed on stage. People would respond, you know, she was not, you know, I mean, and Robin was such an imposing bass player, you know, this tall, beautiful, long haired, you know, sort of intense girl. And Tucci was an amazing guitar player. So we, we did get a lot of, you know, we got a lot of good um, feedback, really. I can't remember any really bad shows I'm trying to think of like the worst show we ever, I think the worst show we ever played <laughs> was in Salt Lake City. Surprise. Um, opening for Lords of Acid. So that was like the, the main first tour we went on was opening for Lords of Acid, um, which is kind of a weird thing, but they were super cool, you know, just really awesome. And, uh, but Salt Lake City, boy, they did not like us. We just, and that was a big place too. It was like the Great Salt Palace. I don't know if it even exists or what it's called now, but it was like 2000 people, you know, it was like kind of a bigger, one of the bigger places. And it was just a sea of people like, like no reaction at all. <laughs> it was, that was, oof, ooh, that's hard, man. <laughs> that's not cool. But um, that was probably the weirdest and worst place yeah. we played. And that's interesting too, because Lords of Acid, they weren't, vanilla <laughs> so no the funny you know the funny thing about lords of acid which was so f amazing to me was that every night they they needed strippers on like you know they had dancers so every day when we roll into whatever city their you know tour manager would you know scout the local strip clubs and get girls to you know come to the shows at night so i've seen strippers from every city in this fucking country and let me tell you the best ones were Vegas and Atlanta and the worst ones, Salt Lake City. <laughs> but yeah, Lords of Acid, they were awesome. They were so much fun to, um, to spend that time with. They were really cool people. Were there any small towns that Jack of Jill also played at that time that surprised you? Like, wow, okay, that was a pretty good turnout. Anything like that ever happened on that tour? Mm -hmm. Quite the opposite. <laughs> one day, our management decided on one of our days off, I think, gosh, where was this? It was somewhere in the Northeast, like New England somewhere, I want to say. And we had a day off and our management had us go play at this weird little club. I think it was called the L and G Club. Right. And it was literally just a bar like with a stage, you know, and and we we go there. And there's literally four people four people we had driven like three hours out of our way on our day off to set up and play the show and there was like maybe four people in the whole place so we ended up just kind of using it as a rehearsal time you know what I mean like we we're just like hey let's work on some new shit while we're here you know like eh. so that it, it wasn't a total loss I guess <laughs> did, you get, did you get paid for at least your time that you were there yeah or we I I can't even remember what our per diems were, but honestly, maybe 20 bucks, you know what I mean? So it was like, I would spend all of my per diem on booze, even though there was going to be booze at the venue, but I needed it in the van as well. We didn't even have a bus. We had like a Suburban with a trailer and a futon in the back of our Suburban. So, and we had the four of us, um, Mike Shook, who was our tour manager and Howard Melman was sort of did merch and you know all the other little stuff and so there were six people in a suburban <laughs> there was one story oh my god so we decided for whatever reason to go off the highway in arizona it looked like a shortcut 
but we didn't take into account the fact that there's like canyons and shit. <laughs> it's like you go off road in Arizona, you don't know what the fuck you're getting into, right? So everybody's sleeping and I see Howard Melman just concentrating so hard. And I'm like behind him, like, I realize it's just cliffs, you know? And he's just like trying to drive. I'm like, you're doing it. You're, you can do it. You got this. It's cool. Like, I'm like thinking we're going to die in like five minutes, probably. <laughs> we also got pulled over in Arizona, a town called Globe, um, where the cops literally brought out the dogs because we looked so weird to them. They didn't like the way they looked. They brought out the dogs. They made us unload the whole trailer. The freaking dogs started sniffing the drum cases. And they were like, who's the drummer? And I was like, me. Meanwhile, the whole band's looking at me like, what the fuck did you do? And I'm like, I swear to God, I don't have anything in my cases. They made me unload everything and there was nothing there. And off on our way, we were able to go. But I, yeah, I got this side eye from the whole band. Like, we know. <laughs> well, it's good that uh, the dogs didn't sniff or find anything. Uh, I think they might have found some weed and just took it in the, you know, but that wasn't mine. That was somebody, I think that might have been the managers. <laughs> did you ever have any moments where the uh, car broke down and you were stranded? Anything like that oh, ever happened? Yes, yes, yes. And that's the worst part because we missed our final end of tour night and party because on our way out of New Orleans, the suburban caught fire. Suddenly there's black smoke coming out of the back and we're, and we're like, oh my God, pull over, pull over. We pull over and we're, we got stuck in Laplace, Louisiana. You don't wanna be stuck there, let me tell you. So there's literally, at that time, there was like one shitty hotel and like a McDonald's like walkable and like some weird bar, like, you know, a mile down that way. So we were stuck there for days I remember me and Jeff walking into the McDonald's and some lady behind us is like, are you all devil worshipers? And we were like, what? I was like, no, <laughs> it's just weird. It was such a, it, yeah. And that was actually the end of the tour. So we, like I said, we missed the last show. I think we missed the last two shows. We missed Austin and LA, which killed me because it was freaking with Rammstein. So we were supposed to open, it was us, Lords of Acid, Rammstein, like in a big venue, you know what I mean? And my friends from LA went to that show. We weren't there. I was like, oh, <laughs> they didn't know we had broken down, but yeah. Wow. That would have been a pretty good opportunity to play. I know. So that was a bummer. From that point, um, I, I, I literally was so done with it. I, I just got my on a flight and was like, I'm out. Peace, you guys. And went home. It was Christmas time. And I was like, I had a, a little son at home. I didn't want to miss Christmas with him. You know, so they, the rest of them waited till the truck was fixed and drove their asses back home. But I was like, no, nah, I'm taking, I'm flying home. I'll see you. Wow. Were you yeah. the only one in the band that had a young child at that time? Mm hmm. Wow. Yeah. What was that like to be gone for that period of time? And um, it was really hard. Like, it was really hard. I was, you know, constantly on the phone and like sending, you know, picking up little gifts and sending him, you know what I mean? But I felt like those other, they didn't understand, you know what I mean? I was emotional a lot about that. Like it was hard. It was really hard. He was little, he was, right. he was like four or something. Yeah. I remember when we did our, we came, um, we were coming through Florida and we were playing a Fort Lauderdale show at a place called the theater, which doesn't exist anymore. But it was a pretty big venue. And, um, my parents came and they brought my son for sound check and he was, he just, he was crying. He just didn't understand why I couldn't hang out with him. I'm like, I have to go over there and do sound check. Right. <laughs> yeah. And he was only four. So he was just a little kid. Yeah, yeah. He didn't get it. But um, yeah, that was a great show. Actually. The homecoming show was amazing. Oh, what bet. a turnout. Yeah. I bet. And that was a cool place to see. I, I like the sound. At the yeah. Time. It was great. Right. Yeah. Saw, saw quite a few shows there. So did your parents make it out to a lot of your shows or was that kind of a far? That was the only one. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. That was the only one. So I'm glad because it was a big one. It was packed and it was like, yeah, see, I'm doing something. Like, honestly, this is something that's real. <laughs> so the homecoming show, that sounds like it was a success. 
good crowd. What happened after that? Um, we, that was still, just, that was like still mid tour. Right. So at the end, you know, or the, uh, after the car breakdown, like, you know, and all that, and I flew home, I was kind of done. Um, you know, sometimes your best friend can turn into your worst enemy type of situation. And that's sort of where we got, um, with me and Jessica and, and Jeff as well, me and Jeff Tucci were a couple. So, you know, we ended up when we were recording in criteria. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Um, we got signed. They, they sent us around a bit and then they put us in the studio and they asked us like, who, you know, who do you want to, as a producer, you know, just throw out names, you know, so we're throwing out all kinds of names. And anyway, Don Fleming, came up and he was from gumball he had produced two of my favorite albums of the 90s it was pretty on the inside by hole and sonic youth by goo and i was like we can get this guy like holy shit we need to get him like he's amazing and we got him and i, I couldn't believe it so he produced our record and we got about three and a half weeks in criteria studios which now i think is like it was it was hit factory i don't know what it's called now but you know, everybody recorded there. Like right. the space is like hallowed, you know what I mean? So to be in those spaces was like amazing to be able to play there. That was really cool. Yeah. A lot of those songs on that record, I did in like one take. <laughs> it was very like, it was just very like, that's perfect. We got it. All right, next, let's move on. And I was like, okay, if you say so. So sometimes I can hear like little things where I would like to change, but Hey, we were under a time constraint. Right. And, um, whatever but that was such a great experience like i'm i'm so glad that we were able to do that was there a favorite song on that record just in, for you as a drummer that was one of your favorites to to play on you know what there was because there was a song in there called lolly rot which i had never learned that was a previous jack off joe song from their previous lineup and it was just they never you know they were just like eh, it's whatever it's a throwaway but Don Fleming wanted that song on the record. He's like, I, I like that song. I, I want that on there. So I had to learn that song in three days. And it has a lot of changes and a lot of things. Like before we went in the studio, I was like, pressure. Like I have to learn this fucking song. Like, like now, you know? And and I did. And I think I fucking nailed it kind of <laughs> when I got in there. I think the pressure was on. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to do this. I don't want to embarrass myself. So I'm proud of that song, even though. I don't have, I don't have, um, I don't have credit, you know, as a writer on that song because it, it pre, you know, it wasn't something that I created with them, but I just learned it. But um, I'm really proud of that, <laughs> that I did that, yeah. <laughs> that I was able to do that. Right. Um, as far as the songs that we, you know, that I'm credited on, Girl Scout is probably my favorite. Was that a song that you helped to to write or helped to write the music for? What was your contribution? Yeah, me and Jeff came up with the music for that. Um, we were just playing around in the warehouse one night, and I had a I had a riff, a drum riff that I had used always used like to practice, sort of sort of a warm up type of riff. And he started putting guitar to it. Um, we brought it to the rest of the band, and it just you know how that works. <laughs> it just sort of came something else. Did Jack Off Jill do any more touring after that? Or was they that they ended up they ended up moving to LA. Jessica and Robin moved to LA. And I as I said, I had a son here. Um and also at that point I didn't want anything to do. Like I was done with that version of everything. So I was like, me and Jeff were like, we're out. And plus Jeff was in load which was like one of the best bands down here. <laughs> you know, he just did this as a favor. And the fact that we ended up as a couple made it extra, you know what I mean? Like he, he did that for those reasons. Well, he really wanted to get back to his own band, which was Load, you know, and they were amazing. So he was, he was fine coming, you know, getting off of that tour and just going back to his other band. Meanwhile, I was sort of at loose ends because I didn't have a band now, you know, and that's when I found Pill Magnet. And Pill Magnet includes uh, Libby Bentley from mm -hmm. the amazing Morbid Opera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Were you aware of Morbid Opera? I know they came up much earlier in the early 80s. How did you learn about what she was doing even before Pill Magnet? 
honestly, they were like before my time. I, they were just not really on my radar. I think I'd seen the name before, like coming up as a kid, you know, like, oh, Morbid Opera, kind of like the same way I saw like Vesper Sparrow or like, you know, like bands, Charlie Pickett and the Eggs or, you know, or the Eat, you know, all of these bands that were before a little bit older. So I, you know, I, I was too young to go to their shows, you know, but I had seen their names on like those flyers from all the venues that you remember those flyers that had like every band that was going to come up, you know, those cool yes. flyers. So I saw all of their names all the time, but I didn't really know much about them. Right. So when I met them again, it's squeeze. <laughs> I saw Bill Magnet. Um, I was off. I was done with Jack off Jill. I was sort of home, like looking for whatever I was at squeeze hanging out. And this band Pill Magnet comes on. And I was just like, wow, I fucking love this band. Like, I want to be their drummer. It was kind of ruthless a little bit because I literally pulled aside their bass player, Mike, and I was like, you need a new drummer, and it's me. <laughs> and he was like, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, former drummer. I don't know. I wasn't being a bitch. <laughs> that is pretty ruthless. <laughs> it is kind of ruthless, but I was, you know, that's how it was. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so then I just started playing with them. So you were seeing them at Squeeze and now you're playing with Pill Magnet. And what was it like getting into that band? Because this is now, I believe the second band where you weren't there from the very beginning of the formation, but you joined later on. So what was it like joining that band with, they already had an existing existing sound and, and all that? Um, you know what? It was actually really easy. I mean, I, once again, you know, it, personalities clicked. We we all were friends. We all were, you know, we were all on the same page. Like we would hang out. It wasn't just a band. It became like friendship and, you know, all of that. We were all kind of partiers as well at the same time. So that was a big part of it. Um, you know, Pill Mac, <laughs> I remember remember Jake Klein, who used to write for like City Link and Excess. He he once wrote about how Pill Magnet, you know, could depending on the night you saw us, it could be like the best show or like, holy shit, the worst thing you've ever seen. Because I mean, we played some really great shows. And then there were some nights where we were so fucked up that it was like each one of us was playing four different songs at one time. <laughs> you know, we're just like, wow. so I remember playing a show at this place called Home, which was off of Griffin Road in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, and Davey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't Home. Around, it wasn't around very long. No, it I wasn't know. because it shucks. It was such a shithole, right? It was. <laughs> like, I was there a couple of times and it was definitely <laughs> Hopefully I... you never saw Pillman play there. No, I <laughs> never that was saw like the worst. No. <laughs> yeah, that was our literally like the worst show ever. I mean, we didn't go on until maybe like three in the morning. And by that time we were all just like you know, forget it. Like, it was just like, oh, we got a play now? Oh, okay. I do remember that about that venue because it felt like the, the time, it can go on until whenever it was over. Like, there wasn't Yeah, any... like, I don't feel like they had any kind of, like, time limits, right? No. <laughs> like, but it's three o'clock, we're going on now? What? Yeah. There were no time limits. And this was for... I like, just... Yeah. <laughs> I remember for that show, which was so funny, like, so I, I come out afterwards, like, whatever o'clock that was, and there's a note on my car window from Jeff Tucci, who was there, who had said, don't worry, it wasn't as bad as you think it was. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yes, it was. <laughs> but then another time with Hill Magnet, we played Respectables up in West Palm, and we opened for Jonathan Richmond, who was from the Modern Lovers, right? And that was like after something about Mary and all that shit, right? So it's, you know, he just, it's him, his guitar, and his stand-up drummer with like one drum. Right. But we killed it. That place was like mobbed up, could not move. The whole crowd was like, it was, and Pill Magnet, I think that was our best show. Like we just, bam, nailed it. You know what I mean? So that was like a high point with that band, I think. Was that the first time you ever played at Respectable Street? I think it was. Yeah, actually, I think it was. So that was pretty cool. I never really ventured north. <laughs> I was always going south. Right. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I think it was. And that was really awesome. I'm trying to think what else. That um, is the longest running venue down in. South. Is it? It is. Yeah. And with Churchill's closed, Respectable oh, wow. Street is, the, is now the oldest one. That's crazy. 
yeah, it's an awesome venue and we had a great time there. <laughs> it's really good. So you mentioned you weren't really going up to Palm Beach to see many shows, is that right? No, no, that drive home was too much. Was there anything ever going on, maybe a little further south, still kind of in that area, but did you ever go up to uh, like Boca or was there anything ever going on up that way? I, musically, no, not really. I, I'm trying to think, like I actually made a list, like I, I you, you had me thinking. So I was like, I, I like wrote it down, like what, what are the places I played? Like I was, go I'm like, okay, plus five lounge. Okay. The plus uh, five. Whatever <laughs> the plus five. Culture Room, Churchill's, Washington Square, Cactus Cantina, Squeeze, Tobacco Road in Miami, uh, Respectables. Oh my God. And here's one I didn't play, but I totally, do you, Flynn's Ocean 71? That was like that punk club on like 71st and Ocean. I used to go there at, as like a 15, this was like Leather Tuesdays though. We would like go there at like 15, 16 years old and sneak in and there'd be like punk bands and all that kind of stuff, right? But I was just like, oh my God, I can't believe I forgot that place. But yeah, no, um, Boca, no, not really. Yeah. Well, I'm glad though I asked because it sparked some other, other conversation with some of the other venues. Flynn's is one of those legendary places that existed back in the early infancy i feel like mm -hmm. of of the scene and there were so many local bands who were playing there and you said you were very i was a kid sneaking in <laughs> yeah they had that like drained pool <laughs> you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah it's crazy if you drive by there now it's like oh quite different yes like like a lot of South Florida. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> did you at all go to any shows at the Cameo? Oh my God. Yeah. All the time. All the shows at the Cameo. I mean, I can't even, gosh, if I think about all the shows, my favorite Cameo shows, maybe Iggy Pop. Um, Portishead was an amazing show at the Cameo. Like just so many shows. Oh my God. I remember seeing Pearl Jam in like 90, whenever that first record came out when Eddie Vedder was still swinging from the rafters. And that was freaking pretty great. <laughs> it's like the beginning of grunge or whatever. Right. It was just like, yeah. So that was, that was a memorable one over there. Yeah. Those are the ones that really stand out in my mind. That another thing, just going through all these old things, I found all these ticket stubs and I was just like, I don't remember going to this concert. I don't remember this, <laughs> but I guess I did. <laughs> right. That's your proof that you were, I was there. I, oh my God. I found, um, I found a ticket stub for Lollapalooza 92. Remember the hurricane Andrew one. So we were there and, um, that was Pearl Jam played that, that show. And I remember we saw Eddie and his girl just sitting in the, in the field, you know, like, and I was like, I think I was on like mushrooms and like maybe ecstasy or something. And I was like, I'm going to go over to him and say hello. Right. So I went over and I was like, hi. And, he wanted to sign something. And the only thing I had on me was a rolling paper. So he signed it and he wrote hi, like H I G H. And he signed Eddie Vedder. And I put it with my Lollapalooza ticket and I never saw it for a million years until I started digging through my shit. <laughs> and I just found it. That's and I was amazing. like, Oh my God. <laughs> and you still have it. I, I, I put it away and I never looked at it and I, just found it. So that was pretty cool. That's why it's still there. Cause, uh, hey, man. <laughs> it was away from public view. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that is super cool. And mm -hmm. just thinking about that too, that's a really cool story. Uh, any other stories like that where you had a chance to connect with other people, whether they were national bands that were coming in from out of town that you had some run-ins with that, that oh. knew some stories. So many stories. I don't think you have enough time, but the ones that stand out, <laughs> we opened Jack Up Jill. When I was in Jack Up Jill, we opened for L7. And after the show, we all went back, L7 and all of us went back to our friend's house um, in Fort Lauderdale. I don't want to out him, but his house was called Hoblium. That was the phone number, H-O-B-L-I-U-M. So they ended up calling it Hoblium. And it was just a it was a beautiful house. I mean, it was a nice, like in today's market, that house would be $700,000, <laughs> but he had like a jacuzzi in the back. And I remember Jessica and Danita Sparks were in the jacuzzi making out 
and the jacuzzi turned pink because of all the hair dye. <laughs> and we were making so much fun of them. That was one. Another one, Tool. So Tool came to squeeze after playing one night. And God, don't ask me what year this was. It was early on. And Jessica starts talking to Danny freaking Carey. Oh, this is my drummer. And I was like, stop. Don't talk of him. No. And he starts questioning me. What kind of drums do you play? Pearl. Oh, Pearl sucks. And I was like, oh God, he hates me. <laughs> I didn't want to talk drums with Danny Carey. Like, come on now. So we all just did a bunch of shots and let it go. But that was one where I was just like, oh God, the cringe. Um, yeah. There were a bunch, but whew, yeah. There was a Courtney Love story I won't get into. Oh, which brings me to, here's another story. <laughs> oh my God. So after I left Jack Off Jill, but before I got in Pill Magnet, I auditioned for Hole. Um, so Brian, Marilyn Manson, Brian, um, gave my number to Eric Erlinson from Hole. Um, this was after Patty Schemmel was like, I guess, in heroin rehab or whatever, and they were looking for a drummer. So Eric Erlinson calls my house. Hey, can you be in LA this weekend? We're doing open auditions. You know, Brian gave me your number, blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, I don't have any fucking money, but I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll be there. I had to learn three songs in four days. <laughs> Jeff helped me <laughs> in the warehouse. He was just, he was my biggest supporter. Um, I managed to scrape together money to get, get to LA. Didn't know how I was getting home, but I was like, okay, I'll get to LA. I had some shit shitty hotel in Kawanga around the corner from whatever the fucking studio was. Um, so I, I get there, you know, I, I check in, they rush me to the front of the line, you know, because I'm somebody's friends. Right. Um, <laughs> I audition. I thought it went okay. Um, they called me, they were like, can you stay for three more days? It's down to you and two other girls. And I was like, Oh shit, really? Okay. I stayed for two more days. I didn't have any money. I didn't, I literally made a deal with the, the guy who was like the manager of the hotel. Like I went out to dinner with him and he let me stay for free. <laughs> like it was like that situation. I was like, I don't know how I'm doing this, but okay. And uh, I didn't get it obviously, but I came down to the last three. So I was pretty proud of myself anyway. But then like two weeks later, they played the VMAs with the new girl, Samantha Maloney. And I was like, God damn it. <laughs> But that was a thing. That is a pretty interesting story. I never knew that you even had that opportunity. What was that conversation like when they broke the news that they weren't going to choose you? Um, it really wasn't even that kind of thing. It was more like, you can go home. <laughs> like, we, we don't need you to stay in L.A. anymore. And I was just like, oh, OK. And then, you know, it's funny. I didn't even realize, like, they had told me you came down to the last three. And then um, my sister's friend, Jenny, was a stylist and she still is. But at that time, she was a stylist in New York. And a few years later, she was styling Melissa Oftimar. And she mentioned, hey, my sister's friend auditioned for you guys a bunch of years back. Like, her name is it. Do you remember? And Melissa was like, oh, we really liked her. Like, yeah, we really, we really liked her. But Courtney wanted to go with somebody else. And I was like, fuck you. <laughs> Yeah. And that would have changed a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. And you would not have gotten into Pill Magnet, which. All right. Which uh, you, you did record an album, right? With Pill Magnet? We recorded an EP. We only recorded an EP. I only recorded an EP with them. So it was only four songs. Again, at Digital Beach with Mike Strick. Um, again, we were imbibing pretty intensely at the time and all kinds of things but I think it turned out pretty good um and I really love I love Pill Magnet and I love them still to this day and I love the songs um right, for those that never heard Pill Magnet before how would you describe the sound um punk rock cabaret with a hint of pixies I would say because we had male female back and forth vocals and um it was kind of raw you know what I mean? But uh, that's what I loved about it. I thought it was great. After that, um, I left them because I moved away for a bit. And then when I came back, um, I ended up 
and this is a few years back later, you know, like further in time with um, Laramie Dean, who was like a surf punk three piece. And that was put together by my husband, who was the manager of a guitar center on Hallandale at that time. So he was surrounded by all these really great musicians. And, and he heard, you know, that, oh, I need a drummer. He's like, oh, my, well, my wife, you know. So I ended up playing with them for, you know, not that long, a little bit, but I found some of our flyers too. And I didn't, couldn't believe how we played a lot, actually. It was me, Laramie Dean, and Juan Montoya. And Montoya, I mean, he's like legend. You know, he's, he was, it was all just for fun, like a side project for us. Laramie Dean is like a one man guy, you know, so everybody's just his side player in his band, you know, like it's not a band, it's him plus whoever's in his band. Right. right? So like, I found some cool, like, you know, Laramie Dean, you know, Tavern 213, Laramie Dean at the poor house, <laughs> you know, uh, Tavern Church. 213 again. Oh, Billabong Pug. Billabong. <laughs> Billabong. Like in Laramie Dean. So, yeah, like that was super fun. I remember one night we played Revolution and the Poor House in the same night. Like it was just like we did a set there and then da -da -da, broke down and did a late night set next door, you know? So that was super fun. And those were my good friends. So that was awesome. Were you into that style of music too, personally? A lot of the surf punk? Nope. <laughs> nope it was a learning experience for me <laughs> like how did I didn't you know. learn like how, how did, what what did you do to prepare yourself for that type of drug? honestly I just had to like listen and practice and like I I really didn't that that was never you know I mean wipe out sure everybody knows that but like I didn't know anything else about it that's honestly that was the extent of my knowledge of surf punk was wipe out <laughs> which I could not play by the way <laughs> That is the the song I think a lot of people are familiar yeah. with. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned Juan Montoya, and to your point, uh, Juan has been in a number of bands and uh, very well respected from a lot of people I've had on the podcast who talk about Juan. Yeah. Uh, what were some of his other bands? I think you mentioned Ed Matusa Struggle earlier. I'm pretty sure Juan yeah. was in that band. Yeah. Uh, uh, he was in Torch. Uh, he ended up going on to do Monstro which oh, wow what a great band um that was up in atlanta though um he's you know i mean he's just like the godfather of guitar down here you know what i mean i feel so fortunate that i've actually gotten to play with like all of the not, i won't say all but some of the best guitarists down here right between tucci juan montoya and dan saratelli i feel like i've kind of hit the jackpot <laughs> being able to play with these really you know really respected at least to me, very respected people. Uh, That's the thing too. Like Dan, I met through Patrick Joyce. That's somebody you should talk to. He's like the living library of the South Florida scene. Like he knows everybody and everybody knows him and he has a good memory. And just sort of coming up through the scene. Like I remember he was in, so, he was in so many bands. He was always around. He was in a band called the Nikki Taylors in the nineties. Right. So that, that was, I want to say that was Billy from, Holy Roll and Hellfires and the Underbellies was, you know, that was probably, I think he was in that band too, but just, you know, Patrick's been around forever in every incarnation as music changed, <laughs> he's been there, you know what I mean? So yeah, he's, he's a resource. I would talk right. to him. Yeah. There's so many people who uh, have such an important contribution to the scene and especially depending on what instrument that they may have played contributed to multiple bands uh, right. in, in, in their time. And you as a drummer, I find that between drummers and bass players, they are, <laughs> the, they are the most uh, in demand. Did you feel like that as the drummer? Um, no, <laughs> not really. But then again, like, I can't really complain because anytime I wanted to play with somebody, they were like, yeah, okay, let's do it. <laughs> so it's not like I ever got like, except right. for whole, but yeah, everybody else was like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> well, there you go. There was no waiting list really. No, no, got not it. really. So I can't really complain about that. Yeah. Who, who else did you play with uh, that we have not talked about yet that you 
past um, some shows or maybe recorded with? Again, like I, you know, after, um, after Pill Magnet and Laramie Dean, I sort of just, you know, I was doing other stuff in my personal life. So I was kind of like, I was having kids and I was doing this, you know, and um, I ended up, I played me and Patrick and Dan Saratelli did like a little short lived thing called King Switch, you know, that we played at the poor house and um, who else? Me and Juan did like a one off at the poor house where it was just me and him sort of, I don't know, like free form, whatever, <laughs> you know, he was like, let's just play and just follow me. And I was like, okay, you know, so like that kind of stuff where it was just like one offs here and there. Um, I haven't really done anything. You know, I played with uh, Ray Fang Henry, who was a drummer from the Creepy Tees, who just kind of does his own thing, you know, like he's he's a personality, you know what I mean? Um, so we kind of jam for a bunch of months. Nothing really came of it. So I've kind of just kept my toe sort of like dipped in here and there. But, um, you know, we'll see. <laughs> Are you still playing or are you? Oh, yeah. I have my drum set up right upstairs. <laughs> I try not to disturb the neighbors too much, but yeah, I still play. Um, me and Libby from Pill Magnet were talking about maybe doing this Dan Hosker music continuum this um, December. Um, I guess the theme is reunion. So I was like, what better? Let's let's reunion. <laughs> Let's let's do it. So she's into it. We're trying to get Patrick Joyce on bass and maybe Juan on guitar and, you know, do something. That would be pretty amazing. I think so. I hope it works. I don't know. I don't want to jinx it, but we're, right. we're trying. <laughs> well, hopefully that comes through fruition. And I hope so too. How long has it been since Pell Magnet ever played together? Oh my God. Long time. A long time. I'm, I don't even know, like 20 years. Yeah. That's a reunion. Which is, <laughs> that, that's a big reunion. Well, it's, and the thing is, it's not even Pill Magnet because two of the people aren't in it. You know what I mean? Like Justin, the guitarist, it lives in San Fran, and um, Mike, the bass player, is not really sort of in touch with anybody right now. Um, so. And that and happens. I mean, there's so many bands that have continued on for whatever reasons that they were and it's just yeah so yeah but uh it's for a good cause and uh, exactly and that's what i think and it also seems like it would just be super fun to just like play a few songs again out on a stage like it's been a minute i'm ready to do it <laughs> let's go <laughs> yeah that is something that uh it's not that far away, really. We're already almost halfway through the year, so it's not. Yeah, we better get to practice then. There Jeez. you go. <laughs> Start rehearsing. So, yeah. uh, you know, I know we spent a lot of time talking about South Florida. Did you at all ever have the opportunity to see any shows elsewhere, like Orlando, Tampa, Gainesville, anything like that ever happen in your life? No, not really. I mean, I'm pretty much a South Florida girl. Like I never really, um, <laughs> I remember me and Missy, um, went to, gosh, was it Tampa to see a perfect circle when Jordy White was playing with them. So we went as guests of him. Um, that was, that was cool. I, I wanted to meet Maynard, you know, but apparently Maynard was not into meeting people. He just wanted to go in the back and drink his red wine. <laughs> And I found out he owned a vineyard and it all made more sense, but <laughs> it's right. like, okay. That's yeah. True. Yeah. But um, no, you know, like not, not really. No. Yeah. I'm South Florida girl. South Florida. Yeah. To the bone. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any venues that you had heard about, but you may have missed it? because your age at that time in South Florida that you just, you heard about and you, you wish you would have had a chance to see a show at to any of those places stand out at all in your, in your mind? Um, no, not really. No, no. I mean, I remember when I was younger before I could get into the button South, like I would be like, oh my God, there's so many things going on there. I wish I could get in. And when I was finally old enough to get in, um, I think the first show I saw there was Body Count with Ice-T. <laughs> and 
mean, that was pretty awesome. But, you know, no, I don't feel like there was, I can't think of any place that I was like, oh, no. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that was a interesting show. Oh, that was awesome. Yeah, it was pretty great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for for whatever reason, I think about, you know, going back to the crowds again and thinking about some of the most uh, uh, intense pits or just people just losing their minds. Uh, what are your memories of those kinds of shows? Anything stand out to you? I mean, I can honestly, that reminds me of like going back to Hollywood sportatorium days. Like honestly, to be like a kid, just with not a care in the world, like literally climbing over people to get to the front. Like I remember one time, <laughs> oh my God, we went to go see like, I want to say it was like Robert Plant, like his solo first, you know, his first solo tour and me and my friends from Leather Tees um, all decided to drop acid in the car and I got split up from everybody and I decided I was going to get to the front of the stage and by myself, separated from friends, climbing over everybody, got to the very front, like, woo, Robert Plant. And then somehow magically found my friends again and had a ride home. You know, it was like the universe <laughs> it was, it was on my side that night but yeah like i just remember sporto days like you know it was just wild there was no security there was no anything it was just a free-for-all <laughs> you know what i mean i remember going to the la forum and same thing you know just like seeing bands out there or i remember oh my god one time we we were in la with jack off jill and uh that was we were recording our video that's what it was we went out to la to record the my cat video right so we were staying with our manager she lived in this you know a house in the hills that she shared with like four other girls it was a beautiful house you know in a beautiful neighborhood but the dwarves were playing you know like down in somewhere in like la so me and jeff went to go see the dwarves and that was a fucking crazy show <laughs> like that was what the fuck i had never seen them i didn't know anything about them right. he's like it'll be great <laughs> like okay so that was nuts i'm just trying to think of other shows where it's crazy like when we played in new york city um at that cmg music fest that was a pretty wild crowd too that was pretty good hi kitty I'm sure depending on where you were, the people were, they could vary from location to location, but the band obviously can bring out those people too. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned about the, the video for my cat. What was that like? Was that the first time you ever recorded a, or you ever were a part of the making of a video like that? Oh yeah. I mean, that was, that was, we, after we got signed, you know, so we had like this budget all of a sudden, you know, so they, it was pretty cool experience. I mean, they, they took us to this, like, um, out, I want to say in like Burbank or studio city or somewhere, this massive airline hangar full of costumes. Like, I guess that they use for the movies and they're like, just go crazy, find some costumes that you like. So we we're just picking shit out and trying stuff on. And, and we ended up with these giant, like fucking beekeeper suits that somebody thought was like, this will be great for the end, you know? So I was like, okay, whatever. So, um, we had this, and I wish I could remember his name. It was like some old pro skateboarder play the main guy in the video, you know? And um, he seemed cool as hell. So we spent a couple days just filming this video. <laughs> I remember when it came time for the giant fucking suits. I, they, I don't know, I think they were beaky. I don't know what they were. They were just these really heavy things with like masks and whatever. If you watch the video, you'll see what it might mean. But like, I couldn't move. I couldn't play the drums in it. It was too heavy and too hot and so i just sat there like this and that's what they got in the video just me like no i can't do it you know um but yeah like that was that was super fun like what a cool time you know I bet. but yeah i i just i didn't know what being like on a set was like and how much downtime you have and you know how much sort of what a drag that is <laughs> i can't remember if the my cat video got any airplay on mtv do you have any recollection of that happening no i think it ended up being more like a promotional thing and like maybe see that was the thing with jack off jill like we would get like press that would seem sort of like oh that's impressive like i remember um when we were touring billboard magazine 
put us like as an up and comer or something. And one, you know, one of those little teeny articles on the bottom of a page, you know, like, Oh, up and coming, you know, because it's like numbers and whatever, like, but that was it. You know, nothing ever really came of it. <laughs> it wasn't really anything, you know? And when you looked at like, they, they have all the data and numbers even back then, you know, of, like how many you sold in this town and how many you sold every town you went to, they knew how many you sold. Right. Yeah. But I also remember like, Oh, here's a good story too. We went to, um, I want to say it was like Portland and we were supposed to do an in-store and we totally spinal tapped it and went like to the wrong store. <laughs> and we're like, where is everybody? And they're like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> was yeah. it a music store at least? Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, it was And here's the even funnier part. The person who worked there knew my sister. <laughs> And they thought I was her. Like, hey, Christy. And I was like, no, but that's my sister. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> yeah, almost. And with your kids being different ages and that sort of thing, have they gone back and discovered what mom did back in that time? Like, do they have any opinions as well? Um, they do. It was funny. A bunch of years back, my daughter was following a certain artist, um, and the artist just happened to mention that one of their favorite bands was Jack Off Jill. And she was like, that, that gave me a bunch of cool points <laughs> as a mom, <laughs> let me tell you. Yeah, so that, that was cool. But yeah, so that, that did happen. <laughs> that is neat, that's very nice. Yeah. Did they ever go back and listen to any of that music or is that not their cup of tea? Um, I doubt it's their cup of tea, you know. They're different generation, different right. age, but, um, you know, I think that they're, they're proud. They're proud of me. They know who I am and what I've done. And, you know, I've always encouraged them to do whatever they want to do. You know, it's anything can happen. If you want it enough, you can make it happen. I think, you know, I, I was like the kid who was literally at 14 and 15 years old, practicing in my garage until my hands and feet bled you know what I mean like literally blisters bleeding and just I wanted it so bad you know I was like I'm gonna be a rock star you know what I mean like that whole thing and you know okay so practice for like 13 years and maybe you'll get to do something <laughs> maybe maybe right. not it doesn't matter as long as you enjoy doing it Definitely. you're fine but to, you know, to your point you know you do need to practice and put in that work and mm -hmm. so oh yeah if there's no passion you know, then no, you're not going to do it. I don't know. It's different now. Like, I feel like it's, kids are different. You know, they have different priorities, but it's okay. And because it is so different now, and if you do wind up doing the Dan Hosker benefit, the, the continuum, anything you would change in your approach, knowing what you know now versus if you were to do this 20 years ago? Um, gosh. I probably, I mean, now, you know, as an older person, I just have more patience with other people's personalities where, you know, back in the day, I was a hothead and a firecracker, you know, you said one wrong word and I was just going to go, go at you. You know what I mean? So that's hard to be in bands with people like that. <laughs> and I, you know, I can't really fault anybody for, you know what I mean? Like, it's just sometimes personalities do that. I think, you know, now whatever you know i can't be mad at people yeah. i don't have the time or bandwidth for that shit you know sure so yeah. and you do grow and evolve and of course right grow. hopefully <laughs> if you don't the there's goal. A i mean there are people yeah. who don't of course but uh <laughs> we all know one or two of those <laughs> yeah and it, it is one of those things where uh, you know you do sometimes look back in retrospect and say well i can't believe that would even upset me knowing how I am. Today. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, I hope that the pill magnet reunion happens. So do I <laughs> fingers crossed. Fingers <laughs> We're crossed. going to try. We're going to try. Happens. And, yeah. I, and I imagine you're in touch with Libby otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. We talk all the time. Very cool. Very cool. For those that have not checked out that episode, uh, with Libby and Carmen, that is an episode worth checking out. The story yep. of Morbid Opera, great episode, and it's just been fantastic. 
having you on, Laura. Thank you so much. It's been so fun just rehashing these stories. Like I kind of put them in the vault for a long time and it was so fun to sort of dig through all the old stuff and be like, you know, that was a really great time in life. Like that was super fun. And I'm glad that I got to experience all that stuff. And uh, hey, man, we have we have an amazing scene down here and we've had an amazing scene for like 30 years. <laughs> always going to be new bands and things happening yep. and uh absolutely but also opportunities for the people today who didn't get a chance to see some of those other bands who came before mm -hmm. play some of those reunion type type shows and, and so or bands that get back together it's always nice to, to see some of that so uh but but yeah and i'm glad you shared some of your artifacts having those visuals laura thank some of the you flyers and some of those I've never seen before. So very nice to see that. And <laughs> thank and, you. Uh, yeah. So as we get ready to close things out, I'd love to give you the last word. Any final comments, thoughts you'd like to share with listeners, viewers alike, um, and give you the floor to take oh. us home. Gosh. Um, again, as I said, I just think it's, we've had a really amazing scene. There's so many amazing people in this town. Um, so many talented people, so many cool people. You know, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this scene. Honestly, it really has. 